Well, thanks, promoters, for joining us today. We're pleased to be joined now by Steve Byler, former at World of Outlaws uh, driver and promoter at Skagit Speedway for many years now, enjoying retirement. And uh, Steve, we thank you for your time here today, and I'm looking forward to chatting here. Well, good morning, Chris. It's good to be here. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Now, for promoters that may not know, um, obviously you ran World of Outlaws for uh, many years, but then also jumped into the um, in the promoter ranks a little bit there. Kind of give us your background in motorsports world and how you made that adjustment into the promoting ranks. Well, I've been in, I've been in racing and motorsports my whole life. I mean, my dad, he uh, raced the first race at Skagit Speedway in 1954. And so I was literally born around the racetrack and went to work there when I was eight years old and built my first race car in high school and started traveling and racing and was with the outlaws from 1989 clear up through the mid uh, 90s and then i bought a speed shop and uh, uh ran that for about five years and bought skadge and speedway in 2001 and then around 2014 i took over the lease for gray's harbor raceway and the following year took over the lease for the uh, state fair park over in yakima so for quite a while we were uh, my group was promoting three racetracks, and we started two traveling series, a sprint car traveling series, and a modified traveling series. So we were uh, pretty heavily involved in motorsports in the Pacific Northwest. When it comes to the promoting side of things, I mean, you were extremely successful. You, you took a, um, a racetrack, and as you have, have praised a lot and preached a lot to the promoters, baby steps. Don't don't take those leaps and bounds right away. Grow it over time, and that really helped you a lot in, in growing Skagit Speedway to what it was when you started to when you retired. Yeah, well, that's the whole thing. My my whole philosophy is just keep stuff simple. I think a lot of people, especially new promoters, they way overthink what they're trying to do, and they don't really know where to start, and they just they they reach out way too far on their marketing and promotions and. You know, I always try to tell people, be the customer. Think like the person that doesn't come to the racetrack. You know, so many promoters, they'll market to their customers, which you don't have to market to the customers. Just remind them. If you're a race fan, you know about racing going on your local track. You really got to focus on the people that aren't coming to your racetrack and figure out what it's going to take to get them off the couch and get them to your racetrack. And one of the things we really worked on, too, was trying to keep it local, you know, I always believe that you should get the neighbor coming to your track before you worry about the person down the street. And, you know, so many people, they'll, they'll buy expensive advertising in a large city, 30, 40 miles away. The average person won't travel 30 or 40 minutes on a weekly basis to do something. They'll travel 10 to 20 minutes on a regular basis. So really focus your, uh, your promotions in a, you know, 10 to 20 mile radius of your racetrack. Well, and with that, too, the days of just opening the doors on race day and expecting fans to show up without any word, it, those, those are long gone. Those are those are way out of there. So what are some of the avenues in marketing that you took um, over the years that were successful for you as far as TV ads, radio ads, anything like that at all? Yeah, you know, back to my comment of about being the customer. Okay, If you don't buy the local newspaper and you listen to Pandora or Sirius Radio, how do you know about what's going on in your community? Yeah. One thing I found that was extremely successful is roadside signage. And yeah. we would take small signs and put them up. And, you know, we would get them on busy intersections, get them on busy highways. Even if we had to go to a business and say, look, I, I want to put a sign up in front of your business on this busy highway. I'll give you a free sign at my racetrack. We'll trade signs. Barter out the signs like that. Because if people aren't, aren't listening to the radio station you advertise on or the newspaper you got an ad in, they don't know about you, but if they drive their car around the county, you're going to see my signs. And if they don't drive cars around the county, it doesn't matter. They're probably not going to go to a racetrack anyhow. So yep. roadside signage has been one of the most effective grassroots guerrilla marketing I've ever done. Uh, posters in your different stores and stuff, that helps a little bit also. But the number one thing I'd say, the most cost-effective way to do it is just get some signage out alongside your highways and get all of your vehicles lettered up. Drive with pride when you're out there driving your car around or your pickup around. Have the name of your racetrack on the side of it so it's a day-in and day-out reminder. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, marketing tactics uh, have changed since um, since when you first started to when you retired. Facebook wasn't a thing in 2001. It was in 2014, 15, 16, and so on. Um, was there ever a time that, that you decided, hey, I've been dumping money into this marketing stuff. I'm going to stop doing that and adjust to this now and do this instead. Right. Yeah, it was probably, you know, 
six or seven years ago, we started experimenting with pulling some money out of different avenues. You know, we used to buy ads a couple times a week in newspapers and several times a week on radio stations. So we started pulling back on a lot of that and we noticed that our crowds didn't affect them a bit. I mean, I, I completely eliminated newspaper ads around here because I just don't know how many people read newspapers anymore. And the radio ads, we always do a big blast right at the start of the season for a couple of weeks to let everybody know, hey, we're open, we're back in business. Yeah. And then we always try to do a blast at least once a month. And usually it's leading up to a larger event. And when we do our radio ads, we always try to include a couple of weeks worth of uh, promotions in there just to where they know there's something going on every week. Well, and with that, with that too, with the promotions and of, of uh, Skagit and even Grace Harbor at the time, you, you had that as well. Um, people know where that track's at, the location I track every single week. But you also um, have promoted a few series, the Washington Modified Tour as well. Talk about the marketing tactics, and was there anything different that you guys did to advertise that series to the fans? That hey, we're coming to town this weekend, or how how was that different than the track itself? Well, when we would go to different racetracks, we obviously tied into their social media. And we handled all the, the marketing part of that. Just give us your contacts and we'll reach out to them. And we'll promote it. And, you know, you, you've got to make people give them that curiosity factor. It's like, I don't want to miss this event because it sounds like it's something really important or something really special. And, yeah. you know, you, you got to kind of create the illusion that this is something you don't want to miss. So with the, with the uh, social media, the best thing we found that grew ours and got people more in tune to it was to give them just short videos and when i say short videos i mean a 10 to 15 second video is all you really want to put out there some exciting racing and some action stuff that's coming up people will watch 10 to 15 second videos you start putting one and a half two and a half three minute videos on there you know they they start it they click off it they don't even see the ad they go right by it yeah. So really kind of knowing that audience again, as you mentioned, that's the key thing that I think a lot of promotions take out is, again, know your audience and who you're marketing to to make things successful there. Uh, Steve, you mentioned the the road signs that you guys did, the racetrack and, and trading those out with uh, businesses there. Aside from that, were there any other creative marketing things or guerrilla marketing ideas that you guys have had over the years that really was successful for you? Well, the biggest thing, we just, we want to be in front of masses of people. This is just a numbers game. If every hundred people you present your product to buys, buys it, if one out of every hundred buys it, it's just a numbers game. You got to get in front of 10,000 or a hundred thousand people. You'll have a lot of people in your grandstand. So, you know, when I go to the, the grocery store, I always park on an install. So people walking around will see me on the install. I always try to position my truck at restaurants to where it's the most visible out on the highway going by the restaurant. You know, all the parades, you know, civic activities, baseball games. I mean, I'll park my truck at a baseball field where there's going to be a lot of people there because those are the kind of people that get out and go do stuff outdoors. But yep. You know, you got to be in all your local parades. You got to be in touch with your local chamber of commerce because they've got a huge network of people on what to do in this town when they come to town. So chamber of commerce is real important. But, you know, the the, the, the parades was really good for us. We put big signboards in the back of the truck and have a couple of race cars with us going through. And like, you know, up here, Cedar Woolley Parade is a big one. It's always on the 4th of July. We do our fireworks show the first Saturday after the 4th. So we got a big sign in the back that says fireworks this Saturday, Skagit Speedway, 7 p.m. You know, and it's amazing how many people see that that have never been there and they want to come up. Well, and, and with that, you know, you mentioned uh, the, the general audience in, earlier in this interview um, being the ones you need to talk to. Your race fans are going to show up right in your shine. Right in your shine. They love racing. But your general audience looking for fun on a weekend I've always kind of told promoters um, that I've talked to in the past, and, and maybe you agree with it here, is that they should go check out a, a minor league baseball game and kind of see what's going on there. Not the game itself, but see how they're catering to the non-baseball fan, because that's what it's all about. You know, like up here in, in uh, Omaha, uh, they have the Omaha Storm Chasers, and they have a water park for kids. They have putt-putt golf for kids. They just want to get you there and have fun. It's kind of the same mentality that the promoters should have kind of looking forward there, too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, not everybody's a race fan. But everybody has something they like. You just got to find that one thing that they like that intrigues them. I mean, a good example is Iowa Speedway. Their IndyCar race was really struggling for many years up there. Now they've hired all these big, you know, top name bands to come in there. And really that event has turned into a huge music festival with a race on the side. Yep. 
thousands, tens of thousands of people attend that weekend now because, you know, they had Tim McGraw there, I think, last year. And, all, you know, they all these top name bands, it's a music festival with the race. It's no longer a race with the music. And the same with your local tracks. People have choices on where they want to spend their recreation money and their discretionary money. Not everybody wants to go to the racetrack every week. So you've got to figure out something to get different clientele in your racetrack that's not normally there. Stuff yeah. like putting on a monster truck show brings in a completely different clientele. Putting on a truck and tractor pull brings in all the farmers, all the ag workers and stuff. We used to do the racing semi trucks up here and that brought in all the trucking companies, all the mechanics, all the tire shops. You know, we try to find stuff. Uh, we did uh, motocross exhibit uh, ex exhibitions and things like that. So that brings in all the motorcycle people. And you've got to just find stuff that brings in a different genre of people that doesn't necessarily know what sprint car racing or modified or whatever type of cars you're racing at your track. The, the toughest thing for a new customer is to teach them how to drive up the road, turn into your driveway, park their car, get out, walk in, buy a ticket, and sit in the grandstands. Once they've done that one time, it makes it easy to get them back. So give them a reason to come to your track the first time. And even if you're not racing your top level cars that night, put them on display in the entry area. So when they see them, it creates the curiosity factor. But yeah, you have to find a way to get people off the couch and ask yourself, be the customer. What would make me want to go to a limited hydroplane race 25 miles from here? I don't have any interest for that, but you know what? If there's a band playing or there's a stunt show going on or something else that intrigues me, that might be what it takes. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned you're, you're pretty big in grill marketing with the signs that work pretty well for you guys. And um, you, you weren't uh, afraid to try new things, but not everything is successful when you, when you try new things. Was there ever a marketing campaign or a marketing strategy you tried, put money into it and didn't quite work the way you worked, you, the way you thought maybe the fans didn't show up, the drivers didn't show up? Anything that kind of just kind of fell flat for you? Well, pr probably the one event that really fell flat for me. I, I promoted a concert one year and I was going to jump into the big league concerts and, you know, I hired a top name bands and stuff. And, you know, I, I put it on Sunday afternoon, which was a mistake. I should have done Saturday night. Anyhow, long story short, I lost about 70, 72,000 bucks on that event. So I quit doing concerts, <laughs> but I could learn what I knew to do, but you know, and again, that was a deal where I had some people I partnered with on it and we were buying all kinds of advertising in the Seattle market, which is over an hour away. And, you know, again, we, 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 that's where I learned my lesson about, you got to get the neighbor, the guy next door coming before you worry about the people down the street. And yeah. uh, if the people drew a 20 mile radius around the racetrack and counted the population just within 20 miles, you would be surprised how many people live even out in the country. Some of these tracks are way out there. How many people live in that area that you've got to get those people coming on a weekly basis to support the track. Absolutely. And, and that's, you've always been uh, known to have that event going on with other things going on at the track other than just racing, uh, obviously to attract that local fan there. So um, Steve, where can people find you these days? I know you're kind of retired. You're done with, um, with the, uh, the racetrack business side of things, you're kind of living life where can people find you these days. Well, you know, in the summertime, I love boating. I, uh, I do a lot of boating out here in the San Juan Islands up here in Northwest Washington. And then, of course, the wintertime, I take my motor home and I go south and, and uh, based out of Las Vegas. And, you know, usually uh, I catch the races down in uh, Florida in the spring. I do all the outlaw stuff at Volusia. And, you know, I'll be heading back to Knoxville here in a couple of weeks. I'll be back there for, for a couple of weeks for the Nationals. And otherwise, I, I, I kind of just watch the racing on – on live streaming i don't go to a lot in person just because i'm doing other things in life and yeah. i enjoy that and stuff but um one other thing i wanted to touch on before we got off here was when you're marketing to your clientele we spent over 50 percent of all of our marketing efforts towards kids and the, the my thought process behind that is this day and age most parents both of them have to work to survive and you get to the end of the week and all of a sudden, the parents were feeling a little bit guilty that, you know, gosh, we've been expected to kid all week. And, and what can we do to make this up? And, you know, what do you kids want to do? Well, we want to go to the races. So we really market a lot of stuff towards children. We get involved in the children's museum, any events, you know, soccer fields, things like that. We really try to get in front of the kids and expose them to Skagit Speedway. That way, as they grow up, 
it becomes the habit for them to go, which they'll pass on to their kids. Yeah, it's always um, if if uh, Junior and uh, his sister have a good time, mom and dad got to come back. So it's it's always, always there for you. But Steve, we, we do appreciate you taking some time here to kind of um, give some tips to uh, the, the promoters that utilize my race pass um, through us. And we hope the promoters that tune in today uh, got some great notes and tips here. This video will be available for you guys on our YouTube channel moving forward as well, too. So Steve, we'll look forward to seeing you on the road and we'll talk to you later on then. That's good. Yeah, I'll be at Knoxville uh, for the Nationals. And of course, I'll be at the Promoters Conference in uh, Daytona in exactly. February. And, you know, always happy to help out other racetracks. Well, I appreciate it, Steve. We'll talk to you soon then. All right, Chris. Take care. Bye.